Good morning. How's everybody doing? I think I need to call uh, Tony Maples to repentance. <laughs> Talking about my gators like that. That's all I need to say about that. I got to preach. <laughs> Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. It's our uh, last week of our series, Game Changers. And we've been speaking about Jesus and the gospel and how that uh, changes things for people. And we've looked at bridges and we've kind of paralleled that with God's bridge that he made that we are able to cross. Um, we've looked at <clears throat> several things that are game changers. We looked at a new birth a few weeks ago, last week we looked at how choices are game changers and how you make your choices and then your choices make you. And so this week we're going to kind of conclude the, the series um, thinking about relationships. And relationships are game changers, you know? I mean, think about it. My wife's not here, so I feel like I have the freedom to say when she met me, it just changed her world. <laughs> right? I mean, think, you quit laughing like that. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Think about some of your best friends. Think about your uh, family. Think about, obviously, your spouse, your significant other. And you meet people and you form relationships, and it just changes the course of your life. It, um, sometimes for the good, sometimes for the not so good. Uh, but relationships can be game changers as well. And so what I want to do this morning is wrap up the series looking at relationships as game changers. So we've been in John chapter 3. We've talked about Nicodemus uh, two weeks ago with the new birth. And then last week we continued on in John chapter 3 uh, where Jesus uh, gave Nicodemus the choice. You know, he says, God so loved the world. He gave whoever believes. Remember, that was the choice from last week. So this week we're going to see Jesus interact with uh, somebody actually quite the opposite of Nicodemus. If you remember correctly, Nicodemus was a really, really religious guy, you know, blah, 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 high class, probably wealthy. He was in the uh, governing body of Israel. He was a Pharisee. I mean, he, he had a lot of notches on his belt, but he was lost and headed to hell. And uh, Jesus dealt pretty straightforward with uh, Nicodemus. He was a Jew. And so this week, we're going to look at somebody, just like I said, the opposite. We're going to look at um, a woman that Jesus meets. And she's not a Jew. And she's not like Nicodemus. She's not very religious. She's not very moral. And Jesus deals with her in a whole different way. And uh, he meets her by this well. And so let's just open our Bibles to John chapter 4. And we will go over this account that Jesus has with this woman uh, at a well. John chapter 4, and we're going to go, where are we going? We're going all the way through verse 26. From 1 through 26 in John chapter 4. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that's where you are. If you get to Acts, you've gone too far. If you don't have a Bible... We got it on the screen for you. So what we're going to do is we'll, we'll probably just work slowly through the text first as we usually do. And then I'll pray. We'll pull some things out, apply them to our lives, and uh, we'll get on with our day. Okay, here we go. John chapter 4, starting in verse 1. It says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Now that's John the Baptist. So the Pharisees, the really religious people here, hey... G this Jesus guy that we're always at odds with, he's starting to gain popularity. He's baptizing more people than John the Baptist. It says, although in fact it wasn't Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he, being Jesus, left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria. Now, let me show, I've got a map of the New Testament times when Jesus was alive. Uh, it's a map of Israel. I think we've got a picture of it up here. And uh, go to the next one. We'll use that one here in just a second. Okay, this is a, uh, 
uh, map of Israel when Jesus was alive. I meant to bring my laser pointer, but I tend to play with it too much. So y'all just have to follow me here. So Jesus there was in Judea in the south. It, you, you can see that Israel was kind of comprised of three different areas, Galilee in the north, Samaria in the central, and Judea in the south. So the Pharisees hear Jesus and his disciples are baptizing. So Jesus says, time to head north and go to Galilee. So there's three routes to Galilee. As you can see, the Mediterranean Sea there is on your left. And uh, the first route that people may take to get up to Galilee would be right along the coastline. I mean, right along the coastline. The second route would be just go straight north through Samaria. Or the most popular route for the Jews at this time was actually to travel east and cross over the Jordan River, like go through the Jordan River into Perea and then head north and that was like, this is like the first bypass route. They bypassed Samaria there in the central area of Israel. And then they crossed back over the Jordan River into Galilee. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, so, I mean, if it was me, I'd probably take the easiest route. I'd just head straight north and go through Samaria. But there's some cultural context we need to understand, some history to this. Uh, the Jews at this time hated Samaritans. And it was reciprocal. The Samaritan people hated the Jews. And just to give you some brief history as to why. Why did they hate each other? Well, grab that other map for me. In uh, around, you know, 7, 720 B.C., um, this is the land of Israel. And it was divided up into two areas. The northern part of Israel was known as the kingdom of Israel. And the southern part was known as the kingdom of Judah. Okay, now think, this is 700 years before Jesus lived, the land was divided up like this, and the land of Assyria became the world power. And so in like 721 BC, Assyria comes into Israel, the northern kingdom there, and they overthrow Israel, and then they deport a bunch of the Jewish people back to Assyria. They leave some of the Jewish people there in Israel. And then they bring some of their own Assyrian people in. And they plant them right there in the northern kingdom of Israel. Well, if you know anything about races, you have Jews and Gentiles. Now, Gentiles are just non-Jewish people. Assyrians are Gentiles. And Jews were not to intermingle with Gentiles. They weren't to marry Gentiles because Gentiles worshipped false gods and idols and things. And so when Assyria brings their people in and plants them in Israel, guess what happens? The Jews that were left in Israel began forming relationships with these Assyrian people. And then some of the Jewish men started going, hey, these, these Assyrian women are pretty hot. Then they started marrying Assyrian women. And so you've got this mixed breed of Jewish bloodline and Gentile bloodline. And so they start intermarrying and having children. And so the northern kingdom of Israel in Samaria, I don't know if you can see the little city there right in the middle. That's the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. And it, it just becomes overthrown with these mixed race Jewish and Gentile people. And they become known as the... Samaritans. That was 700 years before Jesus was born. So if you fast forward 700 years to the time of Jesus in John chapter 4, now you can get somewhat of an understanding of why the Jewish people would rather cross through a river, go up and bypass the area of Samaria. I should be a poet. But, but there was deep hatred because the Jews kind of look down their noses at the Samaritans. They're like, yeah, y'all are mutts. Y'all are half-breeds. There was this racial tension, and the Samaritans hated the Jews just as well. And so what happens is Jesus decides, I need to get to Galilee. And I'm sure his disciples were like, well, I guess we'll just cross over the Jordan and head north and then cross back over the Jordan into Galilee. Jesus is like, nope. Because verse 4 in John said he had to go through Samaria wonder why he had to go through Samaria. You ever heard of a divine appointment? 
You ever been somewhere, you're like, I don't really know why I'm here, and then God just kind of sends somebody to cross your path that you need to talk to? That's what was happening here. Jesus decides, I need to get north into Galilee, and we've got to go through Samaria. So pick up back in John chapter 4 and verse 5. So they travel north. It says, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground, Jacob. Now Jacob is way back in Genesis, Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, okay? So they get to Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, okay? Now this is, this is great. This is what we teach here. This is the truth of Christianity. We teach Jesus is God. He is God in human flesh. But right here, John also wants us to know that Jesus was 100% human being too. He was 100% God, 100% man. He didn't get to bypass the experiences we have. I mean, think about it. They're in the Middle East. It's noon. He's traveling north, many miles, walking, dusty road. Do you think he got hot? Well, would you get hot? Of course. Would you get tired? Of course. Would you need a drink of water? Of course. So we see Jesus' humanity pointed out here to us. And it says it was about noon. Verse 7, here comes the woman. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Now, a few observations here. Samaritans and Jews hated each other. Jesus Christ, God in flesh, lived his life as a Jew. He was a Jewish man. He encounters a Samaritan woman. So two things to point out here. Uh, Jews and Samaritans hated each other and didn't really deal with each other. And, and at that time, men would not speak to women in public. They wouldn't even speak to their wives in public, okay? That doesn't give you a pass to not talk to your wife, by the way, okay? And so Jesus starts breaking all these social norms because he comes to this well and he sees this Samaritan woman. And notice, it says a Samaritan woman, singular. A, one woman. It was just one woman. And you're like, so what, dude? What we've got to understand is, typically at that time in the Middle East, women would go to wells to draw out water, but they would travel in packs. I guess that's why y'all go to the bathroom together still, right? (laughs) So, So women would travel together to wells to draw out water, but listen, they would only go early in the morning or late in the evening to beat the heat. So this woman's by herself, and it's what time is it? Oh, it's noon. It's right in the heat of the day. So we can learn something about this Samaritan woman. It's this. She's an outcast. She's an, we're going to find out a little bit more about her character in a minute, but she's an outcast. She's not very popular with the women in town. Now, we're going to find out in a minute she was really popular with the men. But she's not popular with the women in town. She goes in the heat of the day by herself. She forsakes having other women with her for protection. She was rejected by the other women of her city. She's an outcast. She's a loser. Jesus says, will you give me a drink? Then John kind of clues us in kind of to what I just told you all in verse 8. His disi- well, no, he doesn't, not yet. It says his disciples had gone into town to buy food. So it's just Jesus and this woman at the well. Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, "Uh, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Here's the clue, verse 9, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. John wanted to make sure we got that. So this woman's like, I'm by myself, I'm, I'm rejected, I'm an outcast, I'm a loser. I come to this well, I see this Jewish guy. Men don't talk to women, now this guy's asking me for a drink. Oh, and by the way, he's a Jew. So how can you ask me for a drink? Notice Jesus' answer. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus was a master at this. Jesus could take whatever was going on around him and he could, he could allegorize what was going on and kind of point that into a spiritual truth. 
Remember when the Jewish people were like, the bread, the bread, the manna. You remember the manna? And Jesus was like, I am the bread of life. Jesus could use anything around him to get it to a spiritual truth, and that's what he does right here. If you didn't own the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you'd ask me for a drink, and I'd give you living water. I would tend to make fun of her in verse 11, but I probably would have said the same thing. Sir, the woman said, you have, you have nothing to draw with and the well's deep. Like you're telling me I should ask you for a drink, but you ain't even got a bucket. Like what are you going to do? Dive down in the bottom of this deep well and come up with a handful of water? She doesn't get it. Jesus is speaking spiritual truth. She's still thinking on the physical level. Are you greater than our father Jacob? Stupid question. <laughs> She's talking to the God of Jacob. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? We just got through singing, oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Think about that. Because in verse 13, Jesus could have said, eh, you don't get it, you're cut off, I'll get my own drink, see you later. Very patient, very kind with this woman. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water, can't you see him pointing down the well? Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. He takes it back to the spiritual conversation. Woman still don't get it. The woman says to him, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. <laughs> He's like, I can give you living water. She's like, good, give it to me. I don't ever want, man, it's a long trip here. It's hot. I don't want to keep coming here and drawing water. Jesus is trying to speak to her need. He's trying to tell her, you need something that you can't get yourself. I can provide what you need, but she's not getting it. So Jesus kind of goes another route here. He says to her in verse 16, go call your husband and come back. <laughs> Has anybody ever confronted you on your sin? If you notice here in the conversation, what she's about to say in verse 17 is the shortest thing she said in the whole conversation. She's a talker up until verse 17. And Jesus is like, go call your husband and come back. And she's like, I have no husband. <clears throat> I don't have a husband. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. You know, the woman's probably thinking, yeah, I just said that. What? The fact is, you've had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. So, so down with the notion that Jesus thinks living with your boyfriend or girlfriend kind of equals marriage, right? Cohabitating does not equal marriage, not in the eyes of God. I, I, don't, I don't have a husband. <clears throat> I don't have a husband. Yeah, you're right. You've had five. And that dude you're living with now that you're shacking up with, he's not your husband either. <laughs> The most, probably the dumbest response you could give in verse 19. Look, sir, I, I can see that you're a prophet. Really? Really? He just told you your past. He knows what's going on in your life and he's never met you before. Yeah, I think that might be an understatement. And then like, has somebody ever confronted you on something and then like it gets, it gets awkward and so you don't know what to do so you just change the subject? People are like, hey, uh, I was jogging by your house the other day and, and did I hear you and your wife fighting? And you go, hey, how about them braves? <laughs> you know, that's what that woman does here. Go call your husband. I don't have a husband, right? You've got five husbands and the guy you're with now is not your husband. Oh, you're, 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 a, you're a prophet. Um, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Like, don't talk about my personal sin. Let's talk about religion or something. Like, let's talk about the weather. Let's talk about sports. Anything besides my personal sin got a little awkward for her there, so she tries to 
change the subject. Jesus, ever so loving and patient. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time's coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you don't know. Now, the Samaritans only believed the first five books of the Old Testament were true, okay? And so Jesus is saying, you don't even have the full revelation. You just believe in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. You worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. See, the Jews held to the whole Old Testament. And furthermore, salvation comes through Jesus Christ who lived on this earth as a man, as a Jew. Yet a time's coming and now has come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Like it don't matter where you go. It don't matter if you're at church. It don't matter where you're at. You can worship God anywhere because true worship is in spirit and in truth. It's from the inside of who you are, and it's the truth of Scripture. Jesus says, for they're the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I, I know that the Messiah, called the Christ, is coming. Eh, when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Surprise, guess who you're talking to? Verse 26, then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. I am the coming Messiah that you're looking for. I am the Savior of the world. I am telling you the truth right now. Let's pray. Lord, this is your word and it's truth. And I just pray and ask, Father, that you communicate to us clearly today and give us ears to hear and uh, a heart to receive it. And I just pray that you're glorified in it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Here's the first point we need to see. God cares for people. God cares about people. So that's pretty elementary. Yeah, it, it is, but a lot of times we just skip over that. Think about this woman. She was an outcast, rejected by society. She had no friends. She was a loser. She was immoral. People probably judged her and looked down at her. They maybe even called her nasty names. She was rejected. Get out of here. N nobody wants to deal with you except for God. God in human flesh goes to her. God loves broken people. Let me say that again. God loves broken people. Some of you are here today and you feel broken. Like you do good to wear your little Sunday best and put your smile on your face and your fake mask and blah, 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 blah. But at a heart level, you feel broken. Life's been rough on you. Maybe you can't make relationships work out. Maybe you've lost a job. Uh, maybe your spouse has left you. Maybe you've lost a, a, a child. Maybe through some of your bad choices, now you're dependent on a substance or something, and, and you're just broken. And if you were going to be the real you and come up here and talk this morning, you'd just weep because you're broken. So you need to know this, if you're here and you feel broken and you're, you're struggling or you're failing, God feels compassion toward you, not anger. He's not mad at you because you're broken. He's not down on you because you can't seem to get everything together. He loves you, he cares about you, and he wants to show you compassion. We see that in Jesus. Not only does God love broken people, check this out, God seeks out broken people. Jesus could have ran away from this woman at the well, but he went to her. Jesus initiated the interaction, correct? Didn't he say, hey, give me a drink? Jesus started the conversation because our God not only loves broken people, but seeks out broken people. And he's seeking you today. 
Right, you're like, I don't know why I'm here this morning. I just feel kind of, you know, you're here because God is seeking you. Because God's word is being proclaimed and his truth is being spread in this room right now. And you are being sought out by the God of the universe. Because he loves you and he's seeking you out. God cares about people. Here's the second point. We're all broken and in need. The Samaritan woman was not quite so different than us, if we're honest with ourselves. We're broken. There's something going on down deep within us that we need something. You hear preachers say all the time, you've heard me saying it's true. There's this void in our lives and, and we, we need to fill it with something. Some of you are trying to fill that void with alcohol. Some of you are trying to fill that void with pills. Some of you are trying to fill that void with success. Some of you are trying to fill that void with money. Some of you are trying to fulfill that void with power and things. But, but here's the key. There's one thing that can fill that void, and it's God. That's it. We're broken. We all have a void in our lives. Like, we have this thirst. Jesus kept talking about being thirsty and using water. We have a soul thirst is what it is. In your soul, and I heard this morning on the way here, C.S. Lewis said, you don't have a soul. You are a soul and you have a body. You have a body. You are a soul. And deep down within what you are in your soul, you are needing something. Jesus was telling this, this Samaritan woman, he was like, look, lady, you got a spiritual problem. You've got a void on the inside of you deep down, and you keep trying to fill it with men. That's why you've had five husbands, and now you've got a new boyfriend. You're trying to fill that void with something, but you're drinking from the wrong well. Look, lady, people can't fix you. If you keep drinking from this type of well, you'll always be soul thirsty. You'll always have something nagging deep down in you where you don't totally feel satisfied or fulfilled. She, like us, have four basic needs. She had four basic needs. We all have four basic needs. Every day we wake up in the morning, we need four basic needs filled for our soul. Here they are. Number one, we need acceptance. We want to be accepted for who we are. You need that. I need that. It feels good to be received by others, doesn't it? The problem is, is that most people love us based on what they don't know about us. They love us based on who they think we are because we all put on this fake mask. We think if we live up to a certain standard, we can gain people's acceptance. If I dress in this type of clothes, people will accept me. If I drive this type of truck, people will accept me. If I look like it, if my teeth are straight enough, people will accept me. Like, you might be sitting there thinking, no, nah, man, but deep down within you, you have the need to be accepted. We just put our best face on and we put our best face forward and we fool people. But if they knew everything about us, I'm convinced our friends list would be shortened. We need acceptance, but here's what you need to understand. What she didn't understand. God accepts you. God loves you. And he loves you like no one loves you. God's not like people. God's acceptance is different. Um, with people, there's always conditions. If your teeth are wide enough, if your deodorant's always working, if your clothes are the most expensive brand, uh, then we're, we'll accept you into our group, whatever group that may be. 
But if your house is not two-story, if you talk with an accent, whoop, rejected. And there's all types of stipulations. And so we live our lives striving to be accepted by people. But God's love and acceptance is different than people's love and acceptance. He loves us and accepts us completely. Not based on how straight your teeth are or what kind of clothes you wear or what kind of job you have or how smart you are. God loves us despite all of that. And he accepts us. His love's unwavering. People can't be depended. God's stable. In 1 John it says, God's perfect love casts out all fear. And I think that one of the fears that God lo God's love casts out is the fear of rejection. His perfect love casts out your fear of rejection. Did you know our number one need is love and our number one fear is rejection? His perfect love casts out all fear. We all need acceptance. That's the first thing. Then we all need identity. Identity answers the question, who am I? Like, really, who, who am I? And, and people get caught up on this all the time because people think that they are their hobby. I'm a, I'm a fisherman. I fish. I fish. I'm the best fish. I, I caught a fish. It was, it was that big. You know, I mean, it's like, that's what I do, man. I wake up on the weekend, I fish, I fish, I fish. I got 4,700 fishing rods and lures and whatever y'all use to fish. I don't fish, so... <laughs> Okay, okay, like I'm, I am my hobby, or, or people think I am my role. I am a mom. I'm a mom, and that defines who I am till it's time for the empty nest season of life, and then the kids move out, and you don't know who you are. People think they are their occupation. <laughs> Brett Favre. <laughs> I'm a quarterback, I'm a quarterback, I retire. I don't know who I am. I'm a quarterback, I'm a quarterback, I retire. I, I. Kayla and I have been watching a three-night miniseries, and I'll spare you the details because y'all make fun of me if I tell you what it is, but it was about a, an old R&B uh, group that rose to fame when they were kids and uh, enjoyed worldwide success, smash hits, money, tours, everything. And then, then on the last episode, one of the guys in uh, the, the band, I'll just tell you, I know you all are like, who is it? New edition in the 80s and 90s, okay? <laughs> Don't judge me. Um, one of the guys in the band, it, it showed um, his house was being foreclosed. He was losing it, all of his stuff. And his wife says to him, why don't you go out and get a job? And he looks at her and he says, what? You want me to go open a chicken wing store? You, you want me to go be a salesman? He said, I can't. I sing. That's what I do and that's who I am. I'm a singer. Lest we make fun of him too quickly, sometimes we're like that. I am a pastor. That's who I am. I can get caught up in that. See, we all need to know who we are. Some people don't know who they are. Some people go through their whole life just trying to please other people, and, and, and they're trying to be who other people want them to be. Your identity is found in Christ alone. God tells you who you are. God gives us our identity. Matter of fact, in Psalm 139, the psalmist writes, For you created me, or you created my inmost being, my soul, who I am at the depths of me. You created that. You knit me together physically in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to me. 
My identity is found in Jesus Christ. Sure, I'm a husband, I'm a dad, I'm a pastor, and I love those roles, but those things don't define who I am. Your identity can only be found in God. He made you in your mother's womb. You don't have to go through life searching for who you think you are. You don't have to go through your life trying to be somebody somebody else wants you to be. You're not an accident. You don't exist by chance. You're a unique soul created by God. Revelation 2.17 is really a neat verse. Jesus is speaking about Christians, people who overcome, people who've placed their faith in his death, burial, and resurrection. And Jesus says in Revelation 2.17, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious. What's that mean? Who's victorious? Those are people who overcome the world, overcome Satan, who place their faith in Jesus. Christians. To the one who overcomes, I will give them some of the hidden manna, and I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. When I get to heaven, Jesus is going to give me a stone with my real name on it because he knows who I am. He gives me my identity. It's found in Jesus Christ alone. And, and one thing I, I read this week that I thought was really cool concerning this verse in Revelation 2, one of the bad things about hell is that people who spend eternity in hell, they'll never know who they really were. Because if you don't know Jesus, you don't know who you really are. God gives us our identity. I am a child of God, and he's detailed everything for my life. I'm a pastor, and I love it. I lo you couldn't pay me millions of dollars to do anything else other than what I do in this building every single week. Because that's what God made me to do. He gives me my identity and he's mapped out my life. And you say, well, I think I'm off track. Well, you can get back on track through Jesus Christ. We need acceptance. We need identity. The third thing we need is security. Security answers the question, am I safe? Am I secure? Will my needs be met? If you look around, really, like I don't want to be the, you know, negative guy, but really if you look around in our world, there's danger everywhere. There's disease, there's hurricanes, there's tornadoes, there's tsunamis, all kind of weather issues. There's wars, there's predators, there's criminals, there's instability in our own economy. And we never know from one minute or the next what's going to happen but I am secure in God. I am secure in God. Listen, he's in control. My God is in control. And you can be secure in the eye of a storm with God. And listen, you can be on a beach, kick back in a hammock and not be secure without God. God makes me secure. Psalm 18 too. The Lord is my rock. He's that firm foundation for me. He gives me that security. He's my refuge. He's my fortress. That's who I run to. That's where my security is. It's found in God alone. He's my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. He's my security. He's my rock. Sad thing is that a lot of times, especially here in the United States, people think money makes them secure. Well, if I just get my bank account up to this high, if I can just have my retirement at this point, I'm good. Funny, because Proverbs eleven twenty eight says, those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. Trusting in your money is not the way you want to go. Our security doesn't come from our bank account. Our security doesn't come from how many guns you have at home. Our security doesn't come from anything other than God. 
Acceptance, identity, security. Here's the fourth thing we all need. Every day, we need these four things. Here's the fourth one, purpose. Why am I here? I mean, really, what am I living for? And, and people think the answer to that question is, well, I, I'm here to, uh, to make money. I'm here to make money. I'm here to be famous. I'm here to be uh, successful in business. I'm here to be powerful. I'm here to be influential. I, I, I'm here for all these other reasons, but really those things are misdirected because those things can't fulfill us. And for those of you that are here this morning and you've been trying to make those things fulfill you, you know as soon as I said those things can't fulfill us, something hit you and you were like, yep. I'd never admit it publicly, but yep, he's, he's right. I mean, I showed a video here, I think it was back in January, of Tom Brady. Y'all remember that video? And Brady was like, what, five, six Super Bowl rings, you know, Victoria's Secret model wife, millions of dollars, he's a handsome man, got it all. And what did he say in that video? There's got to be something more. Remember when he told the 60-minute reporter that? There's got to be something more. You're right, Tom. You got that soul thirst we've been talking about this morning. See, I know my purpose. My purpose is to glorify God and to enjoy a relationship with Him. That's why I exist. I want to worship Him, I want to serve Him, and I want to take as many people to heaven with me when I go as I can. That's why I get up out of bed every single morning. Our purpose is rooted in God. It's a kingdom purpose. We're not here to make money. We're not here to see how long we can suck up all the oxygen out of the air. We're here for a kingdom purpose. And we need to live with that eternal perspective. Eric's been talking about that in our Wednesday night classes. Eternal perspective, heavenly perspective, kingdom perspective, so that we can fulfill our, our ultimate purpose. You see people and they have no purpose in their life and life knocks them down. Lose a job, spouse walks out, cancer diagnosis, something happens and life knocks them down. They don't have any purpose. It cripples them to the point where they just don't want to go on anymore because there's no hope. There's no purpose. But it's not like that with a child of God. We gain our acceptance, our identity, our security, and our purpose through Christ. And that's what the Samaritan woman was looking for. She was trying to fill that void with everything that she could. Jesus had the answer. Here's the last point. Jesus fulfills our deepest needs. This woman's broken. Life's knocked her down. And you know what Jesus tells her? He doesn't say, tough luck, too bad for you. Jesus says it can all be fixed if you will let me meet your needs. Don't get another man. Don't get another boyfriend or another husband. Let me meet your needs. The most important thing in your life is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and letting him meet your basic needs. She was looking for a dude to meet her needs, right? Here's what we need to understand. If we don't trust Jesus to meet our needs, we'll automatically transfer those expectations to those people closest to us. In other words, if you're not trusting Jesus to meet your needs, you'll transfer those expectations to your spouse. You'll transfer those expectations to your children or to your friend or to your uh, mom or dad. Guess what happens when you do that? You're just a dysfunctional relationship waiting to happen. Think about your issues and your conflicts within your relationships. Think about it, married people. Maybe your issues came because you were trying to make your spouse Jesus, and your spouse can't be Jesus to you. Your spouse can't meet those needs that only Jesus can meet. I've done that at times in the past. I've transferred those expectations of my needs being met onto my wife, and she makes a really good Kayla and a really bad Jesus. Same with me. I'm a pretty good Kev and I'm a terrible Jesus. 
Either Jesus meets our needs or we'll try to get somebody else to. She had five husbands and it dumped her expectations on a sixth guy. Here's what happens when you trust someone other than Jesus to meet your needs. Number one, your life's filled with disappointment and frustration. If I dump all my expectations of my needs being met on Sam, Sam's not going to come through because he can't. And when Sam doesn't come through, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to be disappointed and I'm going to be frustrated and I'm going to be mad and I'm going to feel like I just can't get anybody on my side. So if you trust someone else to meet your needs, you're going to end up with disappointment and frustration. Number two, you're going to push people away. When you put unrealistic expectations on other people, it creates this tension and then this pressure and it pushes people away. Think about it. People who are overly dependent aren't very attractive to us, are they? You know that needy person in your life that always needs you, and I need a minute, and I need that, and you're like, Ugh. If you don't know that person, maybe you are that person. <laughs> For real, like, confidence is attractive to us, isn't it? I mean, think about it. Even on a dating, like, you see a girl, and you're like, oh, what do you like about that guy? And well, he's confident. She's confident. Nobody likes an overly needy, I need you to be here, I don't need to talk to you. I need, and there's nothing wrong with counseling people and doing these things, but overly needy people are unattractive to us. And if you're trying to dump your needs on someone else, all you're going to end up doing is pushing that person away. Here's a healthy statement for you. I love you and life is awesome with you, but possible without you. That's a healthy statement. Here's an unhealthy statement. I can't live without you. I can't go on. If you leave, I can't go on. That's very unhealthy. That's a sign right there. Ding, you're putting your needs and expectations on that person. I've told Kayla that before. She's like, boy, you're so romantic. And I'm like, look, honey, I, it's for real. Like, I love you, but if something happened, life's possible without you because of Jesus Christ. He's who meets our needs. So because people don't have Jesus, they depend on others. And then if they lose that relationship, life crumbles. They can't go on. But Jeremiah 17, 5 says, this is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man. Did you get that? If you trust in another person to meet your needs, you're cursed because it's not going to happen. Who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. So your life will be filled with disappointment and frustration. You'll push people away. Here's the third thing that happens when you trust someone other than Jesus to meet your needs. You become bitter toward people and you start rejecting people. Think about it. The woman tried to get her needs met by her first husband, but only Jesus can do that. So what happened? She decided, eh, you're messed up. Then she went to man number two and tried to get her needs met from him. Eh, you're no good. Husband number three, he can't get it. Husband number four, he can't get it. Husband number five, they're all messed up. I kind of like men being around, but I don't need another man. I'll just live with this guy. She just rejected each husband because that's what happens. That's what happens when you dump your needs on somebody. They can't meet them, and then you mark them as done, unusable, and then you reject them. She thought five guys had let her down. But what the problem was is she was expecting from a man something that only God could give. We make this mistake. There's been times where we transfer the expectations of our needs onto people in our lives, and then we set them up to fail because they can't be Jesus. Your ex-spouse couldn't be Jesus to you. Your child can't be Jesus to you. Your friend can't be Jesus to you. So there's what happens when you don't trust Jesus. Here's what happens when you enter a personal relationship and trust Jesus to meet your needs. Number one, he heals our hurts. He heals our hurts. The Samaritan woman had pain from the past. She had baggage. She had deep-seated issues going on in her life. Jesus healed them. He healed them. And we all have pain from our past just like she does. Jesus heals us. Second thing he does, 
He satisfies us. What did he tell her? The water I give you will well up in you and be a spring of water, right? You'll never be thirsty again. He who drinks the water I give is never thirsty again. He satisfies us. How many of you have felt that? There's such satisfaction and fulfillment in the life of Christ. Before I was a Christian, I tried to be satisfied and fulfilled by many, many different things. And now as a child of God submitted to his will, it's amazing. It's not easy. It's not easy. God doesn't promise you you're going to get rich. He doesn't promise you you're never going to get sick. Away with people who say that. It's not easy, but it's fulfilling. You'll never thirst again. What kind of husband would you be? if you took the weight off your wife to meet your needs and placed it on Jesus? What kind of wife would you be if you took the weight off of your husband and put it on Jesus? What kind of neighbor would you be? What kind of son would you be? What kind of friend would you be? We need a daily dependent relationship with Jesus. Listen, y'all, Jesus didn't come to start a new religion. <laughs> There's enough of those in his day. Jesus came to make a way to have a relationship with God and experience ultimate soul fulfillment. So we'll end with this. Here's how to have that personal relationship with Jesus. You need it. You need it. Here's how to get it. You got to realize your need. Verse 10, Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, if you knew, like if you recognized. And remember, Jesus is a gift from God. You can have Jesus as a gift. You don't have to come to church for him. You don't have to work for him. You don't have to give money for him. He's a gift from God. So you've got to realize your need. And I, hopefully for the last little while, I've been trying to show you your need for Jesus. So realize your need. Number two, you need to understand who he is. Just like he told the Samaritan woman who he is, you need to understand who Jesus Christ is. He is God in human flesh sent here to die for your sin, and he rose again on the third day. He's the one that was promised, and he's the one that can fulfill your deepest needs. So realize your need, understand who Jesus is. Third thing, confess that you're a sinner. Confess you're a sinner. That's kind of where Jesus took it with the Samaritan woman, wasn't it? Go get your husband. I don't, I don't have a husband. Right, you've had five. He was confronting her with her sin. When you come to Jesus, you've got to deal with your sin. If you don't deal with your sin, then you haven't came to Jesus. I know it's a touchy situation. I know it's a touchy subject for you, your sin, just like her. I don't have a husband. You don't really want to face your sin, but you must deal with it to come to Jesus. Here's the last thing you got to do. Realize your need, understand who Jesus is, confess your sin, and then verse 10, what did he say? If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you, you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you. Ask. That's it. Ask and it'll be given. God, I'm a sinner. I need you. I need you, Jesus. I have a void in my soul that only you can fill, God. And I know I'm estranged for you because I'm a sinner. Our relationship is broken because I'm a sinner and I need you to forgive me. And I trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of my sin. And I ask you to come into my life, Lord. And I ask you to lead me and fill me and give me this satisfaction. All you got to do is ask. Here's the sum up. God loves and seeks out broken people. We're all broken and share similar needs of acceptance, identity, security, and purpose. No one can meet those needs but Jesus. So it's laid out to you. You got the need. You just got to make the decision. Will you submit? Will you confess your sin? Will you ask him to forgive you and trust in Jesus alone? If you will, you'll be saved. You'll be forgiven. Your needs can be met. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you love us so much, God. Thank you that you love broken people as we're all broken. And thank you that you seek us out, God. 
God, I thank you so much for the experience of being fulfilled, Lord. You have fulfilled my life, and I know there are people here who don't have that satisfaction. They don't have that fulfillment, God. They're not feeling their needs being met, and it's because they've been putting the expectations of those needs on other people in their lives, Lord. Lord, I pray that you open their lives, and Holy Spirit, deal with each person and show them that you are the way. You're the way to forgiveness. You're the way to be fulfilled and satisfied, Lord. I pray, God, that you would just save people this morning, Lord, and it's all for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.